thanks for coming, it's lovely to see you all. Um, well, there's been no shortage of musicians, including punk musicians, who've dabbled as actors over the years, but I think there's only one who wanted to be a stuntman and managed to combine that with his on-stage performances. That's Andy Ellison. Thank you. Um, now, Andy was pretty much punk before punk existed. In the 60s, he was in a band with a very young Mark Ballen called John's Children, and they were thrown off a hoot tour for being what Pete Townsend called too loud and violent. Um, and did anybody see Andy in Radio Stars? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, you know what he got to, to on stage, jumping off PA stacks, um, <laughs> swinging from various things. I played with Andy in the 90s version of Radio Stars, and he was up to all sorts. Um, and uh, what, what was it that sparked your interest in, in Stumpbook, Andy? What did you learn to do, that, all that stuff? Well, when I was, you know, at my first secondary modern school, there was a really good PE teacher, and he used to get me into doing all these acrobatics, and I used to climb up these ropes and then fall from a great height, and he taught me how to fall backwards. So this is how my, I thought I'd really like to be a stuntman one day. And you managed to combine that with music as well? Yeah, because I thought, you know, I, I love music and I used to think maybe one day I'd be a pop star. I used to tell my dad, I'm going to be a pop star. But somehow I managed to combine both the manicness of myself and, and music. And uh, for a lot of your musical life, you played with a drummer called Chris Townsend, who you met at school, and it was through Chris you made your, your first stage appearance. Yeah, so uh, I, I was sent off to these boarding schools when I was very young. The first one was in North Devon, which was sort of so far away from anything I did. But I think my parents had got fed up with me being so hyperactive, they sent me there. Uh, that was the school that I had to uh, uh, eventually escape with 30 other pupils and live on Exmoor for three days before we got the school closed down. Next school I went to was Box Hill School in Surrey. And this is where I met this guy called Chris Townsend who became the drummer in John's Children. Uh, such a lovely guy, yeah. But, you know, we went on to, uh, well, when we left school, he went on to, to art school and I became a photographer in Soho. And then one day, um, I was uh, just, just doing my thing in the, in the building and then uh, the lady who owned Rome Studios said to me, there's a guy in the corridor. Um, and I went out, oh my God, it was my old mate, Chris. And he said, Andy, you, you never guess what, I'm playing in this band. And I thought, I never knew that Chris could, you know, was a musician or anything. He said, but you've got to come down next weekend to near Leatherhead again in Fetcham Village Hall because I'm playing in this band called the Clockwork Onion. So it was a Saturday night and I got on the tube and, and then trained down to Leatherhead, went to this gig and there, sure enough, was Chris pounding away on these drums. I, could, I, I had no idea that he could play like that. And this, um, about halfway through this gig, this band was called the Clockwork Onions, which was an interesting name for a band at that time. The singer at that time was a guy called Louis Gruner, who was also from Box Hill School. But at one point, he looked across and saw a guy chatting up his bird at the end of the... Uh, and then he, he sort of leapt off stage and ran after him and saying, Oi, you! and ran out of the hall which was a bit weird, but the band kept on playing. And I thought, well, um, you know, I don't know what's going on here, so... But I had some harmonicas, you know, sort of strap around me, and I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll leap up on stage and start playing. So I started wailing away with my harmonicas, and then he still hadn't come back. So I thought, oh, well, I know, I'll sing. And these were 12 bar numbers, so it's easy to make up words. Next minute, I found myself in this band called the Clockwork Onions. Very strange. Yeah. And the, the band quickly changed its name to The Silence, and there's a long adventure described in your book where um, Chris and the band's bassist John Hewlett bumped into a manager called Simon Napier Bell, who would later manage Wham, and they invited him to come to a gig you were playing at a pool party. Yeah, so locally there was this uh, Burford Bridge Hotel, which had a swimming pool, it's wonderful, just at the bottom of Box Hill, where every year there was the summer 
swimming pool party where we were meant to be playing. Unfortunately, uh, both John and Chris had disappeared and gone off to the south of France. And somehow, uh, I mean, they, they actually were put in jail. This is a very long story, it's in the book, which is very interesting indeed. But uh, anyway, John ha happened to be in uh, Saint-Tropez and, and bumped into uh, this manager, Simon Napier-Bell, who was sitting at a table with Bridget Bardot. And um, uh, I think Simon was, he was taken by John and uh, said, come on, and join us on our table over here. Um, you know, and John spent the rest of the evening telling this manager, Simon Napier-Bell, about how wonderful this band in London was. You've got to come back and see them. By then, we were called the Silence. And when Simon turned up at the gig, you managed to grab his attention quite dramatically. Yeah, so we were, <laughs> we were uh, playing at this Burford Bridge pool party, and uh, we'd played the first set, and then it come to the second set, and I was saying that, you know, I don't see anybody coming here. And then, suddenly I noticed this really smart guy come at the end of the pool um, with a cigar in his mouth, and we went, oh, and I remember John nudging me, he said, that, that's Simon, that's Simon. But at that point, uh, Chris, our drummer, who was also very annoyed from the fact that he'd had a terrible time coming back from the south of France, anyway, that's another story, started to kick his drums into the pool. And I thought, well, I'll just extend this issue. So I climbed up my, onto the top board and uh, started singing, then dived in. Unfortunately, this fused everything, which, is, which was quite interesting. Uh, and then that was the end of that. But Simon then came over and uh, spoke to us and said, um, that was really, uh, that's one of the most interesting things I've ever seen. So I think he was quite taken with <laughs> this silence. And he said, Look, listen, is there a pub nearby? Let's all go and talk. So we went there for the rest of the evening and uh, after, I don't know how many brandies, he said, I want to side you. And uh, you were offered a deal by the Who's label track records on the condition that you changed the guitar player and Simon you suggested you should work with a young folk guitar player who was managing it. He took you to see this guy in Wimbledon. Who did it turn out to be? Right, so Simon was managing a guy called Mark Bowen, which who was a folk singer. And he said, look, um, I've been asked by Kit Lambert, who owned track records with, you know, he was on there with The Who and Jimi Hendrix, and he said he'd like to sign us if we get rid of our tall, lanky guitarist, which was Jeff McClelland, and find somebody a similar size, for some reason or other, I don't know why, but bands in those days all had to be about the same size, you know, like uh, small faces or something like that. Anyway, so uh, I was driven by Simon down to Wimbledon to a little, um, house just off the, uh, uh, next to Wimbledon Stadium, a prefab actually, where his parents lived, and I spent the afternoon there uh, chatting with him and going through songs, and I really wasn't sure whether this guy was going to fit into our band. He had these amazing songs, something like, there was one called Hippie Gumbo, which he played to be cross-legged on a chair, and, uh, but anyway, we got on very well, and then the following day, uh, Simon drove him down to our club in Leatherhead and I've got to tell you at this point we had had a hit in in the west coast of America where Smash Blocks where we managed to buy all this massive equipment which was like Jordan amplifiers which were like a wall of sound and uh, these had satellites that went from one amp to the next amp to the next amp we could only use about sort of like half of them on our stage in our club which was John's Children's Club, which we'd bought by then. Anyway, so Mark turned up that day to, uh, to for our first rehearsal, and uh, he, he couldn't believe it when he walked into our club and saw this massive wall of speakers, and we handed him an electric guitar, which he'd never played before, and he slung it over his shoulder, and he plugged it in, he played a chord, and nothing happened. Then Chris, our drummer, leapt up from behind his double Slingerland drum kit, turned the volume knob, and wow! Poor Mark dropped his guitar and put his fingers in his ears. He'd never heard anything like it before, but we had to say, 
Mark, this is what we play at. We're really loud. And it got louder and wilder and Mark acclimatised to the band because you were, you were given a support tour with The Who in Germany and this band's stage show was quite wild by then and as the tour went on, the manager Kit Lambert basically said you had to tone it down, didn't he? And how did you react to that? Well, yeah, so uh, now we were in Germany supporting The Who, which was incredible. We'd never sort of had our sort of humble existence as the silence in Leatherhead. We're now on tour with our... This is the guys we really, uh, you know, uh, were our, you know, heroes. Anyway, the first night was in Nuremberg, so we got there on stage, and the Who had already done their sound check, and weren't anywhere to be seen. And then our roadies set up this massive wall of <laughs> Jordan amplifiers right the way across the front of their kit, and then put up Chris's double slingerland kit. The next thing we started playing, and no sooner we started than Pete Townsend and Keith Moon ran out from somewhere and going, what, what, what the hell's going on here? They, they, they couldn't have, um, they looked very angry. And I remember that um, Chris, who was, his hero was Keith Moon, uh, saw Keith Moon coming out towards him with a, a beer in his hand, and Chris sort of thrust out his, oh, hello. But the next minute, Keith started kicking his drums and threw all his beer over the tom-toms. And then Pete grabbed a guitar and said, I'm going to plug into these things. What the fucking hell are these amplifiers? And then as soon as he'd started playing, he just started pushing them over. Anyway, it wasn't a very good beginning to that tour. No. <laughs> and, and Kit Lumber told you to tone it down with the wild stage, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, so as the nights went on on this tour, we got a bit... Um, and we were pretty crazy in those days, let me tell you. We had, um, you know, sort of, uh, we, we'd have fights on stage. I, we all had these white outfits where we looked very angelic as John's children and blood capsules and we'd just fight on stage. So, as the tour went on, I, I mean, as we got towards the end of this tour, it was a Ludwig Schaff and, and this was a stadium that was massive and uh, by then, we, I, for some reason or other, Simon had been out and bought me all these bags of feathers where I could run around in the auditorium and throw them in the air so that they could see where I was and then I you know, managed to run back and get on stage somehow. Anyway, uh, this last night was just so unbelievable because no sooner had we started than Mark ran across the stage and started kicking in the lights at the front of the stage and then started slashing his guitar with chains that Simon had bought him and I dived off stage, somersaulted and went into the audience and running around with these feathers, throwing them in the air till the whole place was full of them and I'd, somehow we managed to, uh, I, well somehow I managed to get back on stage but by then the whole place was in was a, a total riot, yeah, it was unbelievable. So Simon rushed out and said, Quick, we've got to get out of here. He, he was dragging me off stage, and I could see Chris was being jumped on by, uh, you know, other uh, hunters, and, and it was really dangerous. I, we managed to get back down into the car park, into Simon's Bentley, and at that point in time, we could see that the riot police were coming into the back, and then also uh, there was they were firing cannons, uh, water cannons, uh, and. The, the most surreal thing I'd ever seen as we were driving out of this car, car park was all the windows at the top of this stadium were smashed out and chairs were coming out everywhere and yet the water cannons were being fired up and we drove out and we went onto the motorway and then there was silence in the car suddenly from this huge noise that we'd been making and there was just, just a few feathers floating around in the car. It was bizarre. That's it. And ten years later, in the punk era, radio stars didn't actually call themselves punk, but because you were doing it the exact same thing on stage, you kind of got lumped in. And um, the, the, mu the music was upbeat and very energetic, like punk music anyway. And um, the band's first single, Dirty Pictures, was banned, but the second one, Nervous Wreck, got you on top of the pops, and then things really took off, didn't they? Yeah. So, oh my God, we were... Uh Suddenly we were linked with all the punk movement, but, but anything. I mean, John's children had invented punk at that swimming pool 
party about sort of 10 years beforehand. But anyway, here we were, I was doing the, the craziest things, you know, and I had a trampette, which is a small trampoline, which was set behind the drums. And before I, uh, as the band started, I'd leap onto this trampette and somersault over the top of the drums on, onto the stage. Uh, sometimes this went wrong. In fact, I put poor um, one of the NME photographers, uh, Adrian Boot, in hospital. But uh, that's another story. But uh, I'm sorry, where were we? No, was, um, <coughs> I think it was about that kind of thing when the things really took off when you got on top of the party. Oh, yeah, so, no, yeah. Right. and then you know, we had a first single out called Dirty Pictures, which is, which is pretty good. Unfortunately, that got banned. So then we had a second single, uh, Nervous Wreck which somehow um, we managed to get onto the top of the pops, which was absolutely amazing. I mean, uh, you don't know, know the power of top of the pops because, well, I think the following Saturday after we'd appeared on the Thursday, um, we were playing at the Nashville Rooms in Kensington and I came on the bus with my mate, the drummer, Steve Parry, and uh, uh, look, we, as we came by, we couldn't believe it. Outside the Nashville room was a queue going down the road, and as the bus went round the corner, the queue went round the corner. We went, oh, it's obviously not us playing here, but it was. That's the power. Oh, and actually, Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten came that night to see us. I think they were trying to check us out. Yeah, and you toured with a lot of punk bands around that time, the, the, uh, the Damned and the Stranglers and Stiff Little Fingers, and you also gig with bands on the fringes of the punk scene, like um, Eddie and the Hot Rods, and there was one really memorable incident. After Star Wars came out, you'd had a lightsaber made, which you used to take on stage with you. Yeah, apart from the trampet, I'd also got this lightsaber, which was absolutely brilliant. Uh, um, a long neon tube, which had a long lead, which an uh, electrical lead, so I used to throw it in the air, spit it around, and then, uh, some of you may have seen it, but anyway, um, at one point, I think it might have been Dunstable or Dunstable City, it was a punk night that we were playing with the Damned. Anyway, I leapt off stage, ran into the audience, and threw the, the lightsaber into the air, and then I looked to my right, and a guy, a punk, had got hold of the, the lead, and he bit it in half. Sparks flew out of his mouth. I'd never seen anything like it. Anyway, I managed to get back on stage. Don't know what happened to him. Oh, isn't it? Well, it's one way to get your nose spiked up, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. And um, at one point, the NME actually put out after the holiday album tour, they published a picture of a skeleton with all the bones you'd brought on the tour. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I'd had so many injuries by then. Um, yeah, from, well, yeah. Well, yeah, there was a list of them all through. In fact, at one point, I actually broke my back, but I never knew I'd done it. That was when I fell from 25 foot, hanging upside down from a lighting rig. Uh, oh, the lights had sort of caught onto my arm, so I had to let go and just smash. I, my head just missed the edge of the stage. I remember, yeah. That was when we did the marquee. He was, he was there with me that night. Yeah. And um, basically, in the original era as well, uh, you managed to completely by chance, you bumped into your old pal from... Uh, John's children, Mark Bolan. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, Mark had uh, obviously been in Monaco for a while uh, out there, and uh, I hadn't seen him for about 10 years, but I was rehearsing with radio stars uh, down on the King's Road, and uh, one day I was running from, uh, from the tube station, running down the road, and suddenly this mini spun round in the middle of the road, and it had blacked out windows, and the windows wound down, and, and there was my, I couldn't believe it, my old mate Mark. And he said, uh, Hi Andy, what are you up to? Thinking, you know, he's up to something strange again. And I said, No, well, I'm just running a bit late for my rehearsal. And he, and he said, Yeah, you're in this, uh, this band called Radio Stars. Now, listen, um, I've got this show coming up later in the year called The Mark Show. Uh, I think Mark was well into punk by then and wanted to introduce, you know, some, some of these young punk bands. And uh, he said, would you like to come on and play on it? And I, I went, oh, wow, yeah, I'd love to, but I didn't hear anything for about six months. But eventually, we got the call, and uh, there we were playing on the Mark show. I think it was about second from last show. And uh, it was only about two or three weeks later, that's when, that's, that's when he died in that car crash in, in Barnes, which 
It's unbelievable. Yeah. And you'd arranged to meet up with him. Yeah, I'd arranged to. Well, I was going to meet up with him for meals in London and have a good chat. But you know. yeah. Well, that, that clip's actually on YouTube, isn't it? The, from the Mark Show. You, it's very interesting. Yeah, I think it's, it's we were playing clip. No Russians in Russia. Yeah, that's right. There are no Russians in Russia. You may know it. And uh, you're still musically active today. Uh, what are you up to at the minute, Andy? Uh, well, I've actually been recording some stuff with a uh, bass player from Paul Weller's band, Andy Lewis. We've got a whole new album that's coming out soon. And another guy uh, called Paul Rowland, who I've done an album with. Um, apart from that, hopefully some gigs soon, especially with you yeah. coming up yeah. soon in Lancaster. Yeah, and you've got your autobiography out. Oh yeah. So here it is. Stunt rocker. Now some amazing stories in this. Also you get a free CD with it with 20 other tracks. A special tonight, it's normally I think it's about 25 quid, but you can get it for 20 pound down there. And money doesn't go to me, it just goes to him. <laughs> And um, if anybody collects records, want to keep an eye out for, when you're in John's Children, there was a single that was pressed up but never released. It's actually one of the rarest records on the planet. Yeah, in back way in, in John's Children, when uh, we recorded a, a song called Midsummer Night Scene, which was by Mark Boland at Spot Studios, a four-track studio in London. Um, when we recorded it, it was fantastic, but unfortunately, it was just prior to the end of John's Children, when Mark had decided to leave the band because we were just too, too noisy and too, well, too dangerous actually. Um, and he said that um, he didn't like the production that our manager Simon Napier Bell had done for this summer night scene. And so there was only about 20, maybe 25 copies that were ever printed. So they're now they're really incredibly expensive. You might be able to find some. I've got one, if you want it. And then, um, in fact, my our drummer, Chris Townsend, had six. But he used them as frisbees and threw them into the woods near Dorking in Surrey. So if anybody wants to go searching for these. Yeah. And um, just, just to sort of round off the, the Radio Star stories, back in the original era, the, uh, people might not know this, but the band were actually offered a major deal with Chrysalis, weren't you? But you, your existing label offered to match that. Yeah, so we were on this small label, uh, Chiswick Records, which was fantastic. And we got to the uh, second album, which we called the Holiday Album, which is a brilliant idea, actually. We thought we'd, for the cover of this album, we'd have a lovely sort of picture of us somewhere a really sort of good resort, so we chose Oxford Circus and put some sand down on the floor and anyway, anyway, the, unfortunately we had this long tour, uh, our holiday tour, and uh, it went on and on and unfortunately because we all had to stay with Chiswick Records instead of Christmas Records because they matched the offer, um, we were obliged to stay with them. But they weren't getting the records into the shops any anywhere. So we were on this tour, and you know, kids were coming up to us and saying, "You know, we, we, we can't get your record." And eventually, um, our bass guitarist, who Martin Gordon, decided to leave the band. And uh, just as we'd been offered 13 dates in America, which is a shame because we probably would have been quite crazy in America and broken it. But anyway. And just, just to let people know, there was a, an unreleased third album which came out on CD last year, didn't it, for the first time? Yeah, there's the third album, which is Broadcasting to the Nation, which is incredible. Yeah. Everybody should get it. So. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I'm saying that. But and to coincide with the book, there's also a double CD anthology which goes right back to the, the silence. There's, we've not got those with us, but that's on Amazon, isn't it, and Easy Action Records, and it goes right back to the mod band where you jumped into the swimming pool right through to today, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. So many songs, yeah. You're, um, from my even my solo bits in between, uh, and three bands. I mean, there's Jet, there's, well, in fact, four. The Silence, John's Children, Jet, Radio Stars, and somewhere in between some solo stuff that I did. Actually, with uh, Ron Stewart, Madeleine Bell, and Dusty Springfield. That's right. On yeah. backing vocals. Can you believe it? 
And you, you just bumped into him the night before and invited him to the studio, didn't you? Yeah, just said, come along. No, no, I don't remember that bit. But anyway, you know better than me. Was that, you were out for a drink and they were in a club, weren't they? Oh, that's true. That, yeah, but that's only because we were with Simon Napier Bell. Yeah. Just wrote, wrote his famous mates in, in the studio, which is great. And, um, and Jeff Beck is actually on one of the John's Children singles. Yeah, but she's mine. Um, we were playing, yeah, we were trying to got this new single coming out. Uh, unfortunately, our guitarist at that time wasn't really cutting it. So Simon said, hang on a minute, I'll, uh, and he got on the line and drove across London to pick up Jeff Beck who came back to our studio at Ad Vision and you know, within like sort of five minutes he'd done this amazing guitar solo uh, right through. Uh, if you ever listen to Butchie's Mind, it's incredible. Well, that, that's, that's on YouTube as well? Yeah. Okay. Well, shall we wrap up with a song? Okay. Fair enough. Here we go. <laughs> Let's see if we can remember the words. This is called Nervous Wreck. Let me give it a go. So I have to leap off here later. Keep breaking here in that area. Thank you for coming, by the way. It's fantastic to see these people here. It's amazing. Destroy my confidence, you broke my love I've gone to pieces now this I don't deserve Wish you could see what you're doing to me You made me a nervous wreck My hands are twitching and I can't settle down My scalp is itching and my eyes all around I chew my nails right down to the quick Cause you made me a nervous wreck now I've been you for years and years of tricks in your games My confidence is long gone You said you changed but it's always the same It's as long I don't think so He electro and several grow He electro and several grow